Welcome to the Thrive Podcast with the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. How, how does your faith kind of play into it or does it play into it? What can be done about it? When I say the church, I'm talking about uh, evangelical white Christians and the black folk who attend their churches. Hello. Welcome to the Thrive Podcast. Welcome to the first Thrive Podcast of 2020 and the beginning of our third year of our Thrive Podcast. We thank you for either viewing on YouTube or listening on iTunes or Spotify. And uh, we thank you for uh, being a continued listener and or viewer of the Thrive Podcast. We always invite you to let us know how we're doing. You can write me at Fred Jeff Smith at Cox dot net Fred Jeff Smith at Cox.net. Let us know up or down, good or bad, how we're doing and how we can make the Thrive Podcast better. I am delighted today to welcome one of Shiloh's bright, shining stars, uh, Ms. Shelley Moore White, as a guest for the Thrive Podcast uh, of the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. Shelley is a native of Baton Rouge. She was born and raised uh, here. She uh, is a member of Shiloh. She is a graduate of University uh, Laboratory School of Southeastern University and of the Southern University Law School. Shelley is a practicing attorney as well as uh, a uh, worker with her family in the funeral business, Miller and Daughter Funeral Home. Shelley, welcome to the Thrive Podcast. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Tell us what it's like to be a part of an entrepreneurial family. Uh, it is really a blessing. It has instilled in me this this great desire to not be tied down and to not be in a position um, at work where I'm not happy and not fulfilled and not doing what I want to be doing. Uh, my grandfather, this is he before the funeral home, there was Miller Fence Company, right? And he he's just always had this entrepreneurial spirit, and he always instilled that in all of us. And as far as the funeral home is concerned, growing up, we always knew that once you kind of got out of college, you were the next thing you were supposed to do was to get your funeral director's license, <laughs> so that whenever it comes time, you can take over or help or do whatever it needs whatever needs to be done. And so for us, it's it's been the funeral home is is everything. It was. The funeral home predates me. It was started in 1980, and I was born in 89. Okay. And so all my summers were spent at the funeral home, but it also enabled my mom to be very involved. So mm-hmm. because because it's a family business, my mama was at all my parties at school, all my softball games, all my choir concerts, whatever me and my sister and I were doing, my mother was able to to really be there because my grandfather was like, go take care of those kids. And <laughs> when my baby, go take care of my baby. Yeah. So with the with the give and take of the family, it, I, cause I love the idea of the family business because mm-hmm. I think having your own business is one thing, but having a business that encompasses the whole family is kind of a, a different a different form of entrepreneurship. Right. It allows us to be, we're so close. We're such a tight-knit family, and I think a lot of that is because of the funeral home, because right. it, we all survive, thrive, and fail, whatever it is. It's all of us, and we're all together, so we're all on one accord at all times, because mm-hmm. this business is what keeps us afloat. It's what right. keeps us able to function in the world. Right. right. You're not just a, a very close-knit nuclear family. You all are a very close-knit extended family. Yes. Uh, there was a Miller family reunion here uh, yes. last year, <laughs> and literally uh, you all took up half of, uh, of, of the sanctuary. <laughs> and, and, and you all had like a three-day weekend of events and things of that sort. It's, it's very clear that you all are a, a very close-knit family beyond just the nuclear family. What's that like? I'm, I'm, I'm from a, a basically nuclear family. It, it was my, my mother, my father, my grandmother, my brother, my sister, and me. And it was just the six of us. And uh, while we had other relatives, they weren't 
an integral part of, of of our family. So what's it like to be a part of, of, of such a close-knit extended family? It's, it's a lot of fun and it's also a little nerve-wracking sometimes because mm-hmm. my cousins and I joke about, well, you didn't hear it on the Miller Pipeline before <laughs> we can tell each other things. Right. Our moms have told it to her sister and I'm a, they told it to my grandmother and everything's everywhere mm-hmm. before we can talk about it amongst ourselves. Right. Uh, but it's this amazing support system. My, I have cousins in in California and New York and Florida. I have cousins all over the country. Right. Not to mention the amount, there's a lot of us that are still in the Baton Rouge area. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's just a huge support system. My cousins will share something that I write or share a, a podcast and I have people listening in places that I would have not been able to reach right. if not for my cousins being in these different areas. And it also provides us a lot of, a lot of times people have this feeling that there might be like a black sheep or something like that. But with so many of us, there's not a black sheep. There's someone you can relate to. Sure. My family is full of AKAs, but I'm a Delta, and I have at least one cousin <laughs> that's a Delta. Okay. So all y'all do all your pink and green <clears throat> stuff, whatever that is, but right. I have at least one cousin. Okay. And we're we're over here. We, we see each other. I understand. It, yeah, it's, it's great. I love being from a huge family. Well, that's good. Uh, did your family play a role in your decision uh, to become an attorney? Uh, because uh, you're 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 an entrepreneur. You're in the family funeral home business. Uh, how did you make the decision that, in addition to that, you were going to practice law? Well. <clears throat> In the funeral home business, most funerals, not most, but a lot of funerals happen on Saturday. Right. And that didn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like So every... this was a scheduling decision. Well, it was it was a little bit of both. It was I didn't like the um the having to be at work every Saturday. That just bothered me. And it also I also wanted to have something that felt like it was my own. Mm-hmm. Because the funeral home, like I said, it predates me. My right. my mom, my grandparents, they and my aunt, they put this together, put all their blood work into this and have built something from nothing. Right. And I like the idea of building something from nothing that is your own. Mm-hmm. And I know that at any point the funeral home is there, it's always there and I can work the funeral home whenever that is. And so with that understanding, I don't have to be there every day right now. Mm-hmm. And so I have the time and the freedom to kind of figure out what it is I want to do mm-hmm. in in the world. Mm-hmm. And as far as being an attorney, Part of being from a family as big as ours is if you're kind of going to be heard, you better be a little loud. You better be able to make your point. You better be able to say what you need to say. Right. And so uh, I remember I was in eighth grade and we had um, it was a debate in in my eighth grade social studies class. Mm -hmm. And we had to ask each other questions. And my teacher said, Shelly, those questions you asked, I wouldn't have wanted to to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about law? And that was really the first time I, I was like, no, I never really thought about that I mean it's eighth grade but prior to eighth grade all my my job as well oh, I'm gonna be a superstar get a pop star stuff like that I never seriously thought about what I was going to do mm-hmm. with my life and mm-hmm. so that was the first time I really thought about it and as time went on I was like I probably I think I, I like this idea of doing this whole law thing and then um, when I was in college one of my friends got into some legal trouble okay and I didn't like the feeling of helplessness mm-hmm. like I didn't I didn't know what to do I didn't understand the process I didn't understand what there was that I could do to help mm-hmm. and that really that was probably the the driving force that propelled me to law school at that point I thought about it a little bit before but mm-hmm. I went to school as a psychology major and then I ended up being a communication major and I like to write and so I was like well maybe I'll just go and try to do the newspaper thing but when I was in college Everybody, the big um, in in my major, the big topic was how all the newspapers were dying, right? And the magazines were dying, and right. so I was like, "Well, I'm not sure how long this is going to be a sustainable thing." Mm-hmm. And so I was like, "Well, law school it is." So. Well, it's interesting that that you say that. Uh, as you know, my sister is also an attorney. Mm-hmm. Uh, she started off in mass communication. Also, uh, uh, she took a journalism law course. And that's what turned her around, and that's what made her uh, develop an interest in the law. And, and of course, that's the career that she pursued. In your career, what's your preference with regard to law? Is it contract law? Is it criminal law? 
do you like being a litigator? Do you like working behind the scenes? What 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 is it that you prefer? Mostly <clears throat> in my practice, as it stands right now, I do a lot of family law and criminal law and some successions because the funeral home just makes that easy to do. Mm-hmm. But if if we're talking about just what kind of law I enjoy, right? I enjoy constitutional law. Okay. I just politics is my thing. I love it. <laughs> uh, probably more than my husband would like me to enjoy it. I, I love it. Um, and the, the Constitution, just understanding how it works and how you can bend it. And I, I love constitutional law. Okay. It was my favorite class in law school. I run around talking about my favorite amendments, the First Amendment. Most people don't even have favorite amendments. Right. And I have a favorite. And okay. I, I love constitutional law. So uh, that's national politics. Yes. or and, and in certain cases, international politics. But you're also deeply involved in local politics. Yes. Uh, uh, and certainly uh, in 2016, it came to my attention how deeply you were involved in local politics uh, surrounding the Alton Sterling shooting and the aftermath of that. Um, what's your sense as a young adult who's deeply involved in the political uh, machinations of this community. Where is Baton Rouge in 2020 as opposed to 2016? Has, has there been any improvement from your perspective? Uh, I don't want to say there hasn't been improvement because there has been. We're, there's a new police chief. Um, th- some things have happened, and the things that have happened have been been good things. But I don't think Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge isn't who Baton Rouge thinks it is. Mm -hmm. Well, depending on who you ask, some of us are very well aware of who Baton Rouge, of how Baton Rouge is and who Baton Rouge is. But Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge has aspirations of being like this, this Austin city, this great mecca of all these different cultures and and ideas. And that is just not what Baton Rouge actually is. Mm -hmm. Baton Rouge is just as Southern and sometimes racist as it's always been. Mm-hmm. And it comes out uh, like with the Alton Sterling murder and with this recent St. George thing that's going on. It's it's real clear that Baton Rouge is who it's always been. It's I love my city. And part of loving my city is wanting to fix it and make it be what Baton Rouge is great as it could be. Mm-hmm. But it's not. Yeah, I, I'm I'm always concerned when people become upset when you're critical about something. Yes. And sometimes the criticism is not designed to be negative, but it's designed to be helpful, uh, right. to, to be constructive, to to point out things because uh, I'm 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 what thirty years older than you are. Uh, I'm also concerned about this city, but I love Baton Rouge. It's my choice to live here. Yes. No, nothing could have made me happier than to live here. I was born here, raised here, spent nine years in Egypt, otherwise known as New Orleans, uh, but but was able to come back to what I consider to be the promised land, and I don't plan on going anyplace else. That does not mean that I have uh, blinders on when it comes to the problems that exist within this community. Within your age group uh, and, and within your social circle, because I, I don't want to think that everybody in your age group thinks the same way. Right. Nobody's monolithic. But within your social circle, what's the 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 prospectus about Baton Rouge and, and, and the future? One of the biggest and most prevailing, I think, narratives that I see about Baton Rouge and Louisiana as a whole is that there's not a whole lot of opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, most is, is we, we joke about it because if you ask people in a lot of people in our age range, what are you, what are you going to do? Oh, well, I'm moving to Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, right. Houston, Dallas. Right. Everybody's moving to Atlanta, Houston or Dallas. Right. And when you ask them why, sometimes it's the the um, a lot of times it's the opportunity. It's mm-hmm. the job prospects and just kind of the um, the quality of life mm-hmm. there. I mean, if you go to a larger city, even if you just go to New Orleans, if you go to a larger city, there's more to do. There's more people. There's And you can find different social groups and different things that sometimes doesn't always feel that like you can find in Baton Rouge. Mm-hmm. Baton Rouge is real... It's, they have the college aspect of Baton Rouge, and then between the college aspect and then kind of just being of Baton Rouge, mm-hmm. there's not much in between. Mm-hmm. If, I mean, because I've... I, I'm, I've never been the type of person to truly like go to nightclubs. And so if you're not going to nightclubs and you're not going to the arcade, 
there's not much to do. Okay. You can go to the movies. Right. But there's nothing, there's not, and I, I will say, there is a, um, there's a lot of, um, it's a poetry scene that's kind of growing, and it's been growing, I'm not just growing, it's been growing probably for the last 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that is something different, and that is something that is unique to Baton Rouge, and they're great. We've but it's had, kind of an underground thing. Right, it's not, what you, it's, you're not going to see it in the newspaper. Right. It's not, and if you don't know the people that are kind of doing these events and, mm-hmm. and heading these events, you'll never mm-hmm. hear about them until they're over. Right. And it's just, I, I don't know, I don't know what we need to do. <laughs> well... Generally, I, I save this question till the end, but it's it's relevant to what we're talking about now. Whenever I have a guest, especially a young person, I ask the question: Do you plan to remain here? Yes. As you think about where you want to live, you and your husband are married. You're going to start a family one day, I assume. Do you want to raise your family in Baton Rouge? I couldn't imagine raising my family anywhere else. It was actually a point of contention at some point because my husband wants to move to Texas. And I was like, move to Texas and, and do what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to do in Texas. Everybody, everything is in Baton Rouge. It's in Louisiana. And I'm of the particular feeling that if everybody packs up and moves to Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, Baton Rouge is never going to progress. Right. If everyone leaves, there's no one here left to do the work on the ground that needs to be done. And mm-hmm. Baton Rouge is either going to just die or just remain what it's always been. Mm-hmm. And I want better for Baton Rouge than what's always been. And so I think it's my personal plight to stay here and do whatever I can to make it better. Because, I mean, this is my hometown. Right. This is my hometown. This is our capital city. Right. You don't have to move to Austin to have culture if you can have culture at home. Right. And so I'd rather do that here. Okay. I like that answer because uh, (laughs) more often than not, people are saying, well, I'm here for the moment. But uh, they always leave open the possibility of moving someplace else. So I'm, I'm, I'm gratified by that answer. Your sister is in elementary education. The first year. Uh, and uh, you're in law. What does that say about the funeral home business and, and the future generation of the funeral home business? Because it is Miller and Daughter, and for those who don't know, your mom is the daughter in Miller and Daughter. Yes, she is. <laughs> my grandfather's Miller, my mom is the daughter. And actually, a lot of people think it's Miller and Daughters because my aunt is, is right. there. They, they do it together. Uh, but I would never ever let anything happen to and daughter whether i have to shutter the law business and go back to the funeral home full-time uh currently my husband's working at the funeral home full-time and kind of learning the business and figuring everything out so i don't know if that's something he's going to want to do long term or not mm-hmm. but at the end of the day it's going to be three at least three or four licenses in this generation and somebody's going to do something with it because my grandfather he's still alive and well but he will not be haunting me for closing miller and daughter i understand i understand <laughs> understand uh with regard to uh changes that are taking place in the funeral home business uh i saw what raven horse sold Mm -hmm. recently and uh uh, other funeral homes have transitioned and they're being bought out by larger conglomerates Mm -hmm. and 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 things of that sort. What does that say about the state of the funeral home business? And I, I bring that up not because I'm I'm being morbid about funeral home business, but funeral home business is one of the few things that black folks still have mm-hmm. that belongs to them. And you, it's sustainable. You, you, you've got the black church and you've got the black funeral home and there's not a whole lot else that you have. And so I'm asking from the standpoint of you as a business person who has a family stake in this. Seeing these funeral homes transition into uh, small franchises of much larger conglomerates, what does that say to you about the future of the funeral home business? Just emotionally, it hurts my feelings. I, I don't, I like the, like I, I I have a very, I love the idea of just the small family business. And I think it it enables you to have like a closer relationship with your, with the, the, the families that we service. Mm-hmm. And so the idea of it being just, because I always feel like something gets lost. Something gets lost in translation from these big conglomerates down to the, the person, the families that we service. Right. I just... I'm not. I don't like it. It's not my favorite thing. I don't foresee at this point it ever happening to Miller and Daughter. Okay. Uh, I I want that to remain as 
family based and family run as it can remain going mm-hmm. forward. Uh, for a lot of people, though, I think it becomes the the um, the cost. It, it's not cheap to to operate a, a funeral home, mm-hmm. um, and the larger companies, of course, have the money to to do it. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of stress because I mean, if if you have a lack of business and a lack of of, of people families that you service, then you're not bringing in enough money to sustain the right. funeral home. So I understand that so for some people it is a necessary decision. But at this point for us, it's, it's not necessary. We're not even thinking about it. It's <laughs> we're good. So we're gonna as long as we're fine, we're gonna keep going with yeah. Been going. That's you all, and, right? And I know that you all are doing well, but. I guess I was asking a more global question about the future of the funeral home business. I have a cousin who who resides in California, mm-hmm. and he was telling me that everything out there is going towards cremation as opposed to burial. And that's a, a, a gigantic shift in, mm-hmm. in how the funeral home business is done. Do you all see those kinds of shifts moving this way. I mean, California is a long way away, but <laughs> we've actually been doing more cremations recently than we've ever done before. But more than it being like this cultural shift of idea, it's more a cost thing. It's cheaper to cremate somebody than it is to have the whole burial and service and everything. Like, I mean, you still have cremation service, but mm-hmm. it's cheaper to cremate someone than it is to bury someone. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've seen a lot of uptick in cremations as we've seen kind of a downturn in people having life insurance. Mm-hmm. And so with less life insurance, there's less money. And so cremation is the cheaper way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally, for the most part... Black people don't like to have anything to do with fire. And, and, and I know that that's been yeah, the, and it, the, the, the still, tradition. That's the heritage. It still is for the most part. It's mm-hmm. the pro- not many people come in seeking cremation. Right. A lot of people will end up in cremation, and that wasn't what they came in thinking that they were going to do. But right. when they start looking at prices and weighing the options, that just becomes the best option. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it, we still – cremations are still few and far between. They're not – down here in, in Louisiana. Right. We do them, but they're not – they don't happen very often still. Um, it's still more burials than anything else. But we yeah. have seen more of them recently, in recent years, than um, than we used to. You were raised in the church. You were raised in, in this church. Uh, as I talk to people of your generation, many of them sitting where you're sitting now, a lot of them will say, well, I'm not really a churchgoer. Uh, started off in the church, uh, uh Still go to church every now and then to make my mama happy, things of that sort. Uh, what's your what, what's your belief about the church, particularly the black church, because you were raised in a, in a black church experience? Uh, I love the black church. I really do. And uh, my relationship with it is probably a little more complicated now than my, my family would like it to be. Um and I don't know. And I don't think it's necessarily a specific church problem. It's a people thing. When you put a lot of different people with different kind of mindsets and personalities in one place and mm-hmm. expect them to just work together for a common goal, mm-hmm. no matter where you are, that's going to create some some complications and some friction. Mm-hmm. But the black church, I think the black church's place in in our community has kind of shifted. And I don't know. I don't. Well, I know a lot of the older generation is not comfortable with that shift, and I don't know all the time that I'm comfortable with the shift, but I still see that it is happening. Because the black church of the the '60s that was kind of this this like shining place on a hill and this this congregation, this meeting place, this 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 like mecca. It's it doesn't seem to be that anymore. And I'm not totally sure. I know a lot of it has to do with the with social changes. Mm-hmm. Um, I know a lot of people don't feel comfortable with the the church's doctrine as far as homosexuality and all these other things. And so I know for some people that is the problem. Um, some people talk about the hypocrites, but you can find hypocrites wherever you go as well. Right. Um, but a lot of times, as far as like going to church. Um, a lot of people my age are just looking for a different 
feeling, a different vibe than you get from the same service you were going to with your grandmother way back in the country. Right. Um, and some churches are, because you have to cater to such a wide age range and so many different tastes, it's hard to, to make everyone happy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I do understand why a lot of people in my generation are kind of going a little less. And I know a lot of my friends might not go to church maybe a few times a year, but they're reading their Bibles and they're praying and they're doing all the things that we're supposed to do, right. but they don't oftentimes go to the actual church Mm -hmm. and they cite many different reasons oh well you know i didn't like that this one situation happened or whatever case may be Mm -hmm. but but yeah it the the, the position of the church has definitely shifted what does the church do in response to that the traditional church I, i recognize that as generations have have cropped up different kinds of churches, uh, have, and I'm not right. talking denomination, I'm talking worship styles and things of that sort. Uh, there are churches that are more uh, music-centered mm-hmm. than than uh, the traditional church may have been. Uh, there are churches, I think that people look for churches that have people in them that look like them. Yes. Uh, uh, a 30-year-old person doesn't want to go to church where everybody in there is 75 years old. That is true. <laughs> they, they, that is true. They're looking around the room to see who is it that I can. Not a youngest person Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> so as, as someone who, who is still a part of a traditional church setting, what would be your advice? What would be your counsel uh, to the traditional black Baptist church as to, and, and, and I threw Baptist in there because I mean, but, it is what but, it is. But, but <laughs> the traditional black Baptist church uh, as, as to how we can better meet the needs of, of succeeding generations. I think if the church, black Baptist churches or churches in general, I think, uh, so like I said, I'm very, the politics thing is, is always in the back of my head. Right. I think one of the things is if we focus focus more on the message and the love than the 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 brow beating and the the damnation mm-hmm. uh, I mean all of it is part of it and you need to understand all of it but I, I do think that <sighs> the black church isn't necessarily a part of the evangelical but the evangelicals make it very easy to understand <laughs> why some people look at the church like, well, what's going on? Mm-hmm. Because they get so bogged down in these these single issues. Mm-hmm. They're so against abortion. They're so against the uh, homosexuality. They're so against these things. And, and the way that they react to them mm-hmm. is with hate and vitriol. And then they turn around and say, but God is love. Jesus is love. Right. And it doesn't. It doesn't connect. There's no there's no intersection between what you're saying over on this side right. and what you're doing on this side. Right. And I think that kind of hypocrisy turns off a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So I think if we could focus more on on the love and on the because I mean every my mom always says every tub has to sit on its own bottom. Right. So I mean if if the if people understand that okay well this is what it says and if you're doing something outside of this that's not good. I don't know that it needs to be harped on. Mm-hmm. It, you said it. We got it. And now let's focus on the love. Let's focus on the nurturing. Let's mm-hmm. focus on the the helping people. Mm-hmm. There's so much more to the message than the what you can't do. Right. And I think a lot of times we get bogged down in the the like the doctrine and the strict rule of, of everything right. when there's, the, I mean, the world is such a big place. There's so much more going on. Yeah. There's a lot that needs to be done that you get lost if you're just focused on these, these single issues. I see it as a difference in perspectives. Uh, the more Old Testament perspective is prohibitive. Right. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. But when Jesus was asked which is the greatest commandment, he didn't invoke a negative. He invoked right. two positives. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And and so I have always taken that to mean that the church is at its best, not when we're trying to restrict, but when we're trying to serve. Right. And uh, uh, I think that we get bogged down in trying to point out the faults in in people instead of trying to uplift people and right. and bring them into places of service. Um, <clears throat> I have this schism in my own head. Uh, 
I recognize intellectually that people have the right to choose to worship anywhere they want, and and and, and I should affirm that. But I got problems <laughs> with black folk who go to white led churches. I have similar problems. <laughs> what's what, what's your point? I'm, I'm older than you, and it's a vested interest for me because of my position as a pastor of a church. What's your perspective? On I that? think there is something powerful and unique about a black church with a mostly black congregation mm-hmm. led by a black preacher. Mm-hmm. I think there is something unique and powerful and important about that space and having spaces where we can come and worship and just be ourselves and have the conversations that need to be had. Because I mean, as we can say whatever we want, but as there's a whole lot of kumbaya stuff going on, but then there are also issues that affect just the black community yes. in a different way that they affect other communities and I think there need to be spaces that those conversations can be had and historically those spaces were the church the church and the black school right and the black schools are not I mean they're almost non-existent right so so the last like the last vesture we have in this is the black church and so me personally, I'm never going to go to a, to a white church. It's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. That's not where I see myself. Yeah. That's not where I see myself feeling comfortable. Because like you said, it, it's something about seeing yourself right. in the pews. Right. And I just... And it's something about affirming black leadership. Yes. When 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 black folk flock to white-led churches, they're saying something, whether it be in their conscious or in their subconscious, they're saying something about their attitudes toward black leadership yes. that they don't accept it that that it's not uh something that they feel that they can be a part of and i'm troubled by that uh because if if if, if we reject black leadership what are we saying about ourselves nothing good <laughs> nothing good <laughs> nothing at all good. I just I don't understand uh, and it happens it happens with the church it happens with other things as well we were talking I was talking to my mother about uh, personal injury cases Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of times um, black people specifically will go will come to like the local black attorneys for their smaller personal injury case and they get hit by an 18 wheeler and they're running to the guy on all the billboards right and you're just like (laughs) right the same it's the same work yeah we can do the same work why is it that you when it's something smaller, it's like, okay, well, I can deal with you for this. Right. But on something larger where it, it might be a lot of money or whatever involved, then you have to run to the white side of town. Right. You're just like, well, it, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's, and it, it it happens with um, with our pricing um, a lot of times. The uh, kinfolk deal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and just the, the, same, the same services that some of my white classmates can charge X amount of dollars for, mm-hmm. I will ask some of my black classmates and even myself, and we look at it, and we can't charge the same thing yeah. because our clientele is not going to pay us the same thing. But if they were to go to some of our white classmates, they're good. Whatever, well, whatever price you say. Price at all. No, not yeah. even going to consider cutting the price. Right. And it's just like, right. why is it that when it's when it's us supporting us, it's always it's always something extra. It's always right. harder. It's always more complicated right. than just this is the service you need and this is the price for the service and let's just do this. Right. It's always something else more complicated. I don't understand. It's. It's this old, it's like this old ingrained idea of white is best and right, it, white is right. The and we got to get out of that. We got to yeah. get out of that. Yeah. That is detrimental. That yeah. That's not helping us at all. That's so detrimental. And talking with, with uh, Reverend Tommy Gibson, who you work with, yes. uh, he, he, he's a pastor. He's also a practicing attorney uh, in, in Baton Rouge. Uh, he says he had to come to the conclusion when he went back in law. He, he had walked away from law for mm-hmm. a period of time. He said when he went back to law, he said he wasn't going to cut his prices. Yeah. My, my price is my price. Yeah. And and if you can't pay my price, then go, go someplace else. But he said constantly clients are coming in looking for you mm-hmm. to it's an cut a deal. It's yeah. an expectation. And you're just like, but, and for some people, of course, you understand. Like, oh, you're my cousin, whatever. Like, some people are actual kin folks. Right. But, just because we're black doesn't mean you're my kinfolks. Right. Like, I don't know you really. 
that. Right. And so I don't know. And it, and it and it it's hard for me because <laughs> I want to help y'all. Like, so I want to cut the price, but then I got to pay my bills too. So Certainly. it's just, I, it, it's, I was telling my husband, like, I have to, I have to get better in 2020 about setting my prices mm-hmm. and leaving them w- alone. Just right. setting the price. This is the price. Either you, you got it or you don't. Right. You can pay it or you don't. And I'm fine with payment plans and all these other things, but this is the price. Right. And I have to get better and stronger about doing that because I, in the last couple of years, I have caught myself a lot like okay well I, I know you don't have it so let me and they have it yeah we had someone come in and we were doing um a succession or something and we were going over all her finances and we saw how much money there was and then when we told her the price she's like oh well i don't ma'am <laughs> we just went through your finances we yeah. see her. and the yeah. price we were giving her wasn't astronomical it was it was a fair price for the services that would be rendered and we, right and we just it <laughs> people are funny <laughs> well, they're funny, but but they're also problematic uh, because they don't they may not see it as 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 being so, but they're actually hindering black entrepreneurs. They really are by by insisting mm-hmm. that uh, you provide the same or superior service for a lesser mm-hmm. amount of money, and it proves to be a hindrance to. Uh, black people improving themselves economically. Uh, and, and if we are proponents of the idea that uh, a rising tide lifts all boats, then you got to help me lift this boat yes. by being a part of the rising tide and not by throwing water in my boat and keeping yes. it <laughs> keeping yes. it down. Um, <clears throat> you're married. Yes. Uh, you, 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 you have a wonderful husband. What's married life like? <clears throat> It. It's great. Um, we dated a really long time. <laughs> uh, we started dating in 2011, and we got married in 2018. So we dated a while, but that was college and law school and all these other things that weren't conducive to us getting married much earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, but I enjoy married life. I didn't. I, I wasn't sure how how much I was going to enjoy it, but I, I love it. My mama acts like, well, no, my sister. My sister's like, y'all are just joined at the hip. Y'all always together. We worked funeral together today. Y'all are just always together. Do yeah. I have to do that? Because my sister, her whole life, she says she's not getting married. And she says now that she sees Britton and I, she's even more sure that she's not getting married. <laughs> she said, I'm not doing all, I don't like sharing my space. I'm not mm-hmm. doing all of that. Mm-hmm. So but we love it. Do you all... Uh... Clearly, because you're you're two individual people, you all don't always agree on everything. Uh, But when it comes to philosophical views about uh, politics, something that you're deeply interested in, you all share the same perspectives on that? Generally. Generally. My husband's a little bit more of an anarchist. (laughs) He's a little more of just blow it up and we'll figure it out. And I'm like, "Uh, no, no, no. You start blowing things up. You don't know what it's going to look like around here. Like, I'm more of a let's work within the systems in place to Mm -hmm. create the change we need to see. He's Mm -hmm. more of a like, so why can't we just tear up the Constitution? Whoa, sir. (laughs) Whoa. Calm down. You're doing a lot. But he was never into politics before he met me. Mm -hmm. I was so proud. I came in the house. I was like, are you watching MSNBC? (laughs) All of your old i'm not even i'm so happy because he was espn all the time didn't care whatever's going on yeah. things will go on as they go i don't really care yeah but that wasn't gonna work hanging around there. so he's all in now well you bring up msnbc that leads me to to something that i i just saw this morning i, I don't know how long it's been out there but i just saw it this morning there's uh on the horizon a 24-hour black news network. I did see uh, that. That's being uh, promoted by J.C. Watt, uh, who is a former congressman, uh, black congressman, I believe, from Oklahoma, uh, conservative Republican. And when I saw that, immediately all of my antennas went up. Mm -hmm. I got a problem with uh, a black news uh, or a 24-hour black news organization that's run by J.C. Watt. Yeah. Uh, and I see, my first question is, where'd the money come from? Yes. <laughs> because that's an expensive proposition. It is. And being a congressman, you didn't make that kind of money, nope. at least you didn't make it legally, just being a United States congressman. So whoever your investors are, uh, I, I'd be curious to know who they are and, and what their background is. Yes. And I see it through through, through a cynical eye, uh, uh, 
I know the white folk love to put black faces in front of hmm. the community <laughs> to promote yes. their agenda. And I see this as an extension of that. That's my theory. What, 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 what's your thought on that? I tend to agree, <clears throat> and I need black people to get smarter. We got to stop being bamboozled by a black face on white rhetoric. Yeah. I just, because it's, it's very easy to pick out. If <laughs> It's not hard to hear where it turns from being someone's own ideas versus something they're just r- repeating back. Right. Uh, and no, I have the same pause that you have about a black conservative. First of all, black conservatives tend to give me pause in general. Right. <laughs> right. Just in general, I, I have I have issues. But to be at the head of this 24-hour black news, because you're going to promote it to black people. Right. And you're going to promote it to black people as something for them, by them. Right. And you very well might be the name on the contract, but... The backing is is an issue because yeah. if it's if it's Fox News paying your bills, then we know the the bit of the news and the capacity for truth. Right. Right. <laughs> um, no, but uh, yeah, definite pause. The idea of having a non-biased black twenty-four hour news channel is amazing. Yeah. And I would love that. Uh, even BET over the years, I'm not a big BET watcher, but mm-hmm. over the years they tried to do these different news shows. And I, every time they did it, I enjoyed them, but right. they never lasted very long. Right. Uh, but I would love the idea of a, a non-biased or even, it, I mean, black, just black based, black centered uh, news channel that was truly for us, by us and about issues that affect right. our community. Right. That would be amazing. But we'll see how this goes. I'm, I, I'm not so naive as to think that all black folk think alike. Right. Yeah, you know, We're not monolithic, and I think that's one of the criticisms that I have of white folk, because white folk think that we all think alike. Let's, let's just get Jesse Jackson out there. Jesse Jackson will, will speak for everybody, or, or if not Jesse Jackson, Ow. then Al Sharpton. Exactly. You know? But but that that, to me, is part of the problem, that we think of ourselves that way. Not everybody who's black is going to be a Democrat, and everybody yeah. who's black is going to be a progressive. Yeah. And some of us are progressive about some, some things, things and very conservative about others. I, too, would welcome a a 24-hour black news program that painted the full spectrum of what it means to be black in yes. America. But certainly, if you're going to do that, part of what you have to do is highlight the racism and the discrimination that is not history. It is today. It yes. is contemporary. It is right now. You know, we, we, we all flock to the movies. Uh, we're going to go see the movie about this this gentleman who oh, was put mercy. on death row. Yes. Just mercy. We, we, we're going to all go see that. And we're going to come out of the theater and some of us are going to be in tears and some of us are going to be shaking our fists and we're going to be angry and we're going to say, isn't that shame? Isn't that a shame that that happened then happens but it's happening right now yes and we tend to have more of a backward view towards uh these episodes of discrimination rather than a a present and a forward view towards that how do we change that well, I because your generation is is the one that's coming onto the scene mm-hmm. now. Uh, I, you know, my generation, we old, we, we moving <laughs> off. Your generation is coming on. How do we get you guys to stop thinking about things as as it being in the past? But it's it's right now. Personally, and me, Brittany and I both, I've taken hiatus from going to see those movies. I'm not going to see Just Mercy. I was supposed to go see Harriet. Didn't go see that. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to see all these movies about racism and slavery as this this um, like old idea. Mm-hmm. Because I do think that it, it, it fosters this narrative as if all this was old stuff and all this is happening in the past. Mm-hmm. And it... it because if you see, if all the movies you see that show racism are just the Just Mercies and the Harriets, and it's all these old timey movies with the, the old clothes and the old cars and all this, and the only movies you see of present day are the Black Panthers and right. the Bad Boys, then you, you, you're you losing something in translation. You're missing the, the fullness of what 
what is actually going on, um, the movie we did go see, we went and saw Queen and Slim. Now, okay. it wasn't, I didn't like it very much. Okay. My husband loved it. I did. I was, I had issues with it. My issues weren't about the subject matter. It mm-hmm. was about some other things. She was supposed to be a lawyer. She should have been smarter than she was. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. I, I, I haven't she, seen it yet, so I, I, I don't She was doing know. stuff, and I was like... <laughs> Why are you doing this? You're supposed to be the smart one. Like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> but, and Britain was like, you're just looking into it too far. Just take it for what it is. And what it was, was showing a more, re- I mean, it was, it was sensationalized a bit, but it was showing the, the, the relationship between the black community and police. Mm-hmm. And that is something that is relevant and now, and you can't escape it. And mm-hmm. a lot of people, mostly white people, want to act as if the, the relationship between black people and police is a black person problem. Mm-hmm. And it's not. Mm-hmm. Now, it could be partially a black person problem, right. but it is also a police problem. Right. And until we, until that, the fullness of that situation is understood, it cannot be fixed. Mm-hmm. As long as you're just acting as if the problem rests on the black community solely, it's never going to be able to be fixed. And so part of the depiction of black black films and black books and and black TV shows, the the current things need to show a more realistic um, depiction of what's happening mm-hmm. because it's not always we're not always laughing we're not always singing and dancing and right. doing whatever we're not always praying right. you need to show what's truly happening because right. the the black community is like you said it's so vast there's so much going on I have friends that live in New York and go to fashion week and all these other things and then I have a friend who is a, a local high school teacher and she tells me some of the things that are going on with the children at her schools and I'm just like I can't imagine like living through that as a high school student right. there's so much going on and if all you're putting on TV is giggles and sunshine people are going to miss that right and right. and you, that's how you start feeling isolated mm-hmm. because you think that it's just happening to you yeah. and you don't feel seen and you don't feel heard. And that's how things devolve into so much more dire straits. Yeah. I just the problems are so big and they're so hard to tackle. But there are things we can do. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to see any more of those movies. I'm not going to any more slave movies. I'm, so, so, so how do you respond to the argument? Well, and I, and I don't know this to be true about all of these movies that you just named, but if it's a black producer, if if, if it's a black director, uh, if they're black stars, how do you how do you respond to the argument? Uh, if you don't go to these movies, if you don't support these movies, then then uh, you're making it less and less likely that these people will have work. It just depends on the movie. I'm, I'm not going to see 12 Years a Slave. I'm mm-hmm. never going to see that. I, I love uh, Ava, du, uh, Ava DuVernay, and I wouldn't watch When They See Us mm-hmm. because I see black people get beat up and killed and everything else on the news. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to watch that in my pleasure, my leisure time. I'm mm-hmm. not watching that. Mm-hmm. I don't even watch the, when the when someone is murdered by the police. I don't watch those videos anymore mm-hmm. because I can't keep feeding that stuff into mm-hmm. my spirit because mm-hmm. it was taking a toll. <laughs> I can't keep doing that. Right. And so if we're going to talk about what's going on currently and that, I mean, if that's what we're going to do, let's talk about it with solutions. Let's talk about it with what can be done and not just... People, people were calling um, Queen and Slim and the, uh, when they see us, people were calling it torture porn. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, I, we don't need to be tortured anymore. Right. We, we've done the torture. Right. We've done the torture. Let's show other aspects of black life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've been known <laughs> to buy a movie, buy a ticket to a movie and not go see it. I've been known to, okay, so I, I enjoy this director, I enjoy these actresses, I enjoy this actor, but I don't want to go see it. So you've bought a ticket to support the person, but you don't want to actually see that. that mm-hmm. I've never heard anybody say that before. That, that's an interesting... Because, I mean, the support is important. And Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the—in Hollywood, they were making—they've been making the case over the course of years that, well, if you make movies with black actors and black actors, people won't go see it. Right. Well, that's not really the case. Right. We just want you to make different things. Right. We want you to make things that are more relevant and more—that are more conducive, uh, more indicative of what black life is in America. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've been known to to buy a ticket and just not go. I don't—I don't want to see this. Okay. But I don't want to not support because I don't want you to have that argument. I kind of like that idea. So, yeah, the black— Dollars are still going. Yeah. I'm just not going. Got gotcha. you. <laughs> I'm just not going to see it. Got gotcha. you.
You're doing this podcast for us, and I'm grateful for that. You have your own podcast. Talk yes. to talk to us about uh, May We Approach. Yes, so it's the May We Approach podcast. It's myself and three of my law school classmates, Maya, Avery, and Paris. Uh, we all met in law school. We didn't know each other before law school. Mm-hmm. None of us. Um, we all are from very different walks of life, very different um, places. Maya's a, a army brat. She's been lived all over Arizona, Memphis, like all over. Uh, Avery is um, like everything about Grambling State University. She was <laughs> she was Miss Grambling. Well, that'll make Terrence happy because he's a Grambling. Oh, uh, she was Miss Grambling a year, a few years back. The whole family, dad, mm-hmm. his band director whole family uh, and Paris Paris is the mother of two and all these things so we're all very different but we're all um, politically aware mm-hmm. uh, at this point we're all practicing lawyers mm-hmm. uh, and we kind of saw a need um, specifically in the black community uh, a lot of people like my husband just don't find politics interesting mm-hmm. and they don't find it where people are just kind of breaking it down where they can understand it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of um, what we talk about, there's we do two major segments. We do like courtroom topics, and that's when we talk about kind of the law and the politics and what's kind of going on in in America. Mm -hmm. And then we do kitchen table topics, and that's where we talk about everything else. And so it's kind of this this fusion and this meeting of kind of politics and just kind of black culture. Mm -hmm. And it's told from the perspective of four millennial professional black women, 29 to 32 and okay. and we're out here we're every week and every you're weekend. uh give me a typical topic that that will be a kitchen table topic uh we recorded last night and what did we talk about oh, okay so the last topic we talked about last night was this new kind of trend of women proposing to men for marriage and really? we yeah okay. uh, around christmas we saw oh, i saw this article about uh, the skier lindsey vaughn she well the article was actually incorrect but what i saw was that she proposed to her now fiance i can't remember his name he's a hockey player which okay. i can't remember his name right. <laughs> but she proposed to him and it was like it kind of reignited this this conversation that i'd seen before cuz mm-hmm. way back when love and hip hop was first starting in the season finale uh, chrissy proposed to jim jones and we were like, this is this is weird to me. Mm-hmm. And I think I thought it'd be an interesting topic. So we all, uh, Paris didn't record with us last night. She was busy. But Maya, Avery, and I had this conversation on the air about kind of how we felt about the women proposing to the men. And we're all... We're, I'm a super feminist, but and there are kind of levels of feminism. But okay. I, I'm a super feminist, and even me, I don't I don't like that idea. Okay. <laughs> I don't like the idea, the notion. Well, and I don't like it for me. I'm not telling anybody else if that works for y'all. Sure. Go ahead. But I was proposing to Britain. It sure. was never going to happen. Sure. It never would have happened. And so that's kind of what we. It's it's. We'll talk about pop culture topics and just kind of what's going on. Nick Cannon and Eminem were having a rap beef a couple weeks ago. We talked about that. Uh, but a lot of times it's just kind of... You know you just lost me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know who Nick Cannon is. I know who Eminem is. is Way back I when... I didn't know that they had a beef. Well, that's because it's old and it should have been over with. But okay. like in 2009 it started and it randomly got reignited a couple months ago. We were like, what is going on? Okay. But we were lost with you. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. But yeah, it's just kind of pop culture culture and just kind of what's going on um we talked about um there was a um a, a girl she was at one of the elementary schools in West Baton Rouge I can't remember what school it was and it was an issue with how she was wearing her hair a little black girl mm-hmm. how she's wearing her hair to school I think she had like braids with beads on the end and it was this whole big hoopla about this child's hair mm-hmm. and so we talk about that and what it is to kind of be black in these spaces and then this time period in right. America and like on a greater scale, but specifically in Louisiana, because right. right. Louisiana and the, the American South is a uh, animal all its own. <laughs> well, I know that your uh, uh, you, your interest lies in the Constitution. My politics is far more local. I'm 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 far more. You and my brother would would get along famously. <laughs> uh, he loves national and international politics and can write dissertations on it. And I'll read two paragraphs and tell him, "Oh man, I really enjoyed that art." That was great. I, that was I, great. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Eric, if you're listening, no, I didn't read the whole thing. But <laughs> but uh, uh, I I'm far more interested in what's going on here. Yes. I'm interested in the upcoming mayor's race. I'm interested in what's going on with the Metro Council. I'm interested in Baton Rouge Area Foundation. I'm interested in BRAF and BRAC 
saying that we can find $50 million to dredge a lake. Oh, yes. But we can't (laughs) find any money to deal with panhandlers and homeless people. Those are the kinds of things that concern me. $50 million upset me personally. I was very upset about that. Britain heard me rant about that for a few days. I was very... Where we have fifty million dollars, so fifty million for algae in a lake, right? <laughs> for algae in a lake that no one uses, right? The lake, no, no one swims in. I that had no lake. idea before I read the article that the lake is only three and a half feet deep. I had no idea no. that it. It, it seems deep. I can walk places. in it. Yes, it's three and a half feet deep. So why why did you build a lake that's only three and a half <laughs> feet deep in the first place? And you're going to spend fifty million dollars and chalk it up to what well, is going to bring more more things, more events to LSU because that's everyone's great concern in Baton Rouge. Their well, only concern well, well, in Baton Rouge. It, it, it is the you know Bobby Jindal killed himself by attacking LSU. Yeah. Uh, that that that's the that, that, that's the great. Uh, Wizard of Oz. You, you, the only one they're concerned about. You, you don't mess with no, LSU. You don't. And I know how you feel about Alabama football, so I'm gonna <laughs> leave that <laughs> alone. But, but uh, how do you how do you differentiate between your national political perspective and your local political perspective? Because they're not always the same. They're not always. I the watch same. MSNBC too, but I get frustrated that they think everything that happens happens in New York and Connecticut yes. and in Virginia. Yes. And and there's a whole other part of the country that they don't pay a whole lot of attention yes. to. So how, how do you navigate between the national perspective and the local perspective? I understand why we don't get a lot of attention on national news. Because the general conventional wisdom is down here is going to be red no matter what happens. Mm-hmm. And so it's not that interesting. Mm-hmm. And I get that. Um, that's why a lot of people feel like their votes don't matter. But that is my, the hill I am willing to die on. Mm-hmm. That voting and voting in local elections is what, is what actually creates change for people. And I people don't understand that. And it baffles me every election time that they don't understand that. Mm-hmm. But going to vote for president every four years isn't going to do you much good if you're not voting at the other elections. Right. We almost, well not we, but they almost elected Eddie Rasponi yes. to be the governor of Louisiana. Yes. This man with no experience, yes. with no plans, and not <laughs> and a particularly problematic relationship with the president. Yes. I, and and we're, was happy to do so. And 30 years ago, we almost elected David Duke governor of yes. the state of Louisiana. He lost. He did But lose. he got 700,000 votes. 700,000 plus votes. So, between David Duke and Eddie Responi, that's a good question to ask you. <laughs> There's like a 30-year gap between these two candidates. What does that say about our state? We're not. That, that, that David Duke got so many votes and Eddie Responi came within a whisper of becoming governor of the state of Louisiana. And the only thing that he ran on was that I agree with Donald Trump. Didn't have a plan, didn't have a platform, didn't have cared. anything. And, they didn't and, and 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 all he said was, I agree with Donald Trump. And he came within 40,000 votes of winning. What does nowhere. that say about, about us? We're going nowhere fast. <laughs> Everybody wants Louisiana to skyrocket and be at the top of all these different lists. We're at the top of all the bad lists and the bottom of all the good lists. Right. And everyone acts as if no one understands how we got here. Well, y'all almost elected David Duke. Then you did elect Bobby Jindal. Right. And elected him again. Right. <laughs> you elected right. Bobby Jindal twice. And, of course, now if you ask anyone, well, no, I didn't vote for Bobby Jindal. Well, somebody did. Right. Because the second time, he didn't even go to a runoff. That's he right. He just won. That's right. So someone voted for him. And I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I know I didn't. And I wouldn't. And I wouldn't vote for Eddie Responi. But the fact that <sighs> white people need to wake up. To be perfectly honest, that is the problem. The the Southern strategy way back when convinced all these white people that as long as they were doing better than some black people, they were okay. Right. And the Republican Party was going to help them continue to be better than at least some of these black people. So just keep voting Republican. Right. We're gonna we're gonna take all your food stamps, because if we're being honest, and more white people on food stamps than black people. Yes, they are. They're gonna take all your food stamps, they're gonna take your health care. <laughs> they're gonna do all these things that that affect you negatively. Right. But as long as Donald Trump's up there saying racist things and Eddie Rasponi is agreeing with him, you're good with that. Yes. 
And I don't understand what it's going to take for white people to stop voting against their interests and what it's going to take for black people to show up. To oh, vote Lord. All. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Because I've been saying that for, you are voting against your own best interest. I just I don't get it. White people need to stop voting against their own interests and black people need to vote. And if we all do these things, <laughs> we might actually be at the top of some of the good lists. Right. I just I don't. The problems are complicated, but the like moving towards solutions mm -hmm. isn't. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why people make things harder than they need to be, because mm -hmm. it's not that it's not that bad. It's not that hard. Vote for people that know what they're doing. Vote for people with plans. Vote for people with experience. Right. It's it's not rocket science. Right. I don't know what we were talking about this last night on the podcast. I don't know where this this anti intellectualism came from, mm -hmm. where being mad and and not liking people with with knowledge and experts on situations. How did it become that experts don't know anything? But I'm gonna trust my gut and just right. do what I need. Right. How do you know what to do? Right. You've been bankrupt seven times, sir. You don't know <laughs> what to do. I just it, it doesn't make any sense. But it's interesting you bring up the term anti-intellectualism because I think that that same kind of thought process permeates all different aspects of black life, including the black church. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, one of the things that turns off, getting back to people of, of a certain generation, one thing that turns off people of a certain generation is, is this idea of uh, a theology that is intellectual as opposed to just conversational. You know, let's just talk about getting over. And, and and let's just talk about God's got something good for you, and and and, and don't worry about your haters. Got a blessing with your name. You're, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and there is no intellectualism involved in it at all. And uh, you know, one of the things that 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 we have tried to espouse is the need for uh, clergy to go to school. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't like you, you, You're a lawyer. <laughs> you went to law school. You, you had to pass an exam to become a lawyer. A, a doctor has to go to medical school and pass uh, all kinds of exams in order to become a doctor. And, uh, an architect has to go to school. An accountant has to go to school. Anybody can stand up and say, I'm, I'm a, a preacher. preacher. I've been called. <laughs> and, I've and, been called. And, 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 and I'm not saying that God does not call because I mm -hmm. had my own call. But after the call, I went to school. Yeah. <laughs> And I learned a couple of things. Yeah. And I got some things straight. And, and I had some things that I thought I knew that I found out I didn't know. And I'm still in the process of that. But when it comes to the church, we throw intellect completely out the window. And that's a source of tremendous frustration to me. It's frustrating to me that black clergy don't want to go to school. I don't know whether it's don't or doesn't, whichever one it is. <laughs> we don't want to go to school. And, and and when you talk about going to school, you don't need that. You don't need that. Why not? How is it that it's okay for the person in the pew to have a higher educational quotient than you do? I don't know. How, how is, I have members of this church who have seminary degrees who ain't ministers. They, they simply wanted to go to school and learn. How is it they're more curious than clergy is? You know, my T. Meyer, she's a minister now, but when she went and graduated from seminary, she wasn't. She just loved she it. She was and curious. She just wanted to know. Yeah. So she drove to New Orleans. Like, I remember this. I was younger, but she drove to New Orleans all the time and spending the night and doing all this stuff. And we were like, what are you doing? Yeah. But she just wanted to know. Yeah. She just had this curiosity. She wanted to understand. She wanted to know what was what. And so she she did that. And now she's a minister, so it all worked out. Right. <laughs> and she's being able to use the, what she learned and what she studied. But I don't understand this this want for, for lack of knowledge. It's it's even the same thing in the schools that the, the smart kids get teased. I don't I don't understand why being being I don't want to say dumb, but <laughs> being less informed yeah. is, is, is what is aspired to. Yeah. I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't. Well, we share that. I don't get it. I don't, I just don't get either. it. Cause I like knowing what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I enjoy knowing what I'm talking yeah. about. So I just, I couldn't, I can't fathom wanting to not know so I can talk about things, yeah. which is just what social media is. Well, yeah. <laughs>
I find social media to be an interesting tool. I, I like it. I use it. My wife says I use it way too much, but it's it's a way that I can stay on top of things yeah, uh, and stay informed about what other people are thinking. Uh, I used to do that with talk radio. Got tired of listening to Rush Limbaugh say the same I stupid understand. stuff. All, I all understand. Yeah. But uh, uh, one of the things that brought you uh, to my attention uh, when I first came here uh, as pastor of the church was your ability to write. Uh, you, you, you wrote poetry, you, you spoke it, and you spoke it from a place of conviction in your own heart. Uh, before we started taping, I asked, are you still writing? And you said, not as much as you would like to. Right. What, what, what is it that you get from writing that, uh, that, that you don't get from anything else? Writing is like my first love. I, I don't, I love the the idea. I, I love the idea of putting pen to paper because mm-hmm. I don't normally when I write something I won't. I'm, my, I'm on my computer all the time, but when I get ready to actually write something, I never type it. I write it on paper. Mm-hmm. I love the idea of putting pen to paper. It's like cathartic. It's just. It's it's always been like my my safe haven. It's mm-hmm. been where I can just put everything down and just close the book, and no one no one sees it until I want you to. Right. Uh, and like I said, in a family like mine, a lot of things don't get kept <laughs> where you leave them. Right. So I like the idea of I can say whatever I want, put it all on paper, and putting it on paper it gives weight to it. Like mm-hmm. it it's real now that I've written it down, and once I close the book, that's it. And it's just, it's there. It's gone. And I know where it is and I know what I said, but you don't know about it. Right. And I love that feeling. Um, law school kind of ruined me. <laughs> uh, I used to read and write a whole lot more. But mm-hmm. then when I had to do it, it just, I, even now, I, I find it, I'm constantly buying books. I was like, when are you going to read them all? Look, at some point, I'm going to get back into it and it's going right. to be fine. They're all going to be here waiting for me. Right. But law school made me not want to read anything because I was just so tired of looking at words. Sure. And it was kind of the same thing with the writing because before, prior to law school, I was a whole lot more... Um, active with my writing and then law school you writing 20 page papers for no good reason you just I don't want to write anything else today <laughs> but, but uh, a lot of times what happens is something something jolting would happen because mm-hmm. when Alton Sterling happened I was actually when Alton Sterling was murdered I was studying for the bar exam mm-hmm. I was taking a hiatus from social media because that's what you're supposed to do when you're studying for the bar exam because you don't really have time to waste and I actually didn't even know about it for a couple of days because I wasn't on social media. One of my classmates who was supposed to be studying as well and clearly was not texted me and was like, did you hear about this? And I was like, what is going on? Right. And from that day, I was doing my hiatus and I was back on the Internet. And that is when I wrote. Um, um, which one was that? When your hometown becomes a hashtag. Mm-hmm. Um, that one, that one in the. Um, Baton Rouge, <laughs> Baton Rouge gives unique opportunities to write about things that probably you wouldn't have otherwise. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the blog pieces I wrote that got picked up kind of a little nationally was about the Spanish Town Parade uh, a few yeah, years back. Yeah, I was hoping you would mention that. A few yeah. years back. Um, some white people aren't very nice. Mm-hmm. And I don't think they even understand the the kind of trauma that exists in the black community and how things they do affect us. Mm-hmm. Um, the Spanish Town Parade, I know you know, but everybody else doesn't know. The Spanish Town Parade is a local Baton Rouge parade that um, is known for kind of pushing the envelope and being a lot of satire things, and they poke fun at things, whether or not they should. But I don't even remember what year that was. I guess that might have been 2016. 2016 was a crazy year, a Mm. crazy year in Baton Rouge in general, but a crazy year in Baton Rouge. But um, that particular year, they were poking fun at a lot of the um, black people that had been killed by police. Um, I remember the um, one particular float they had, uh, they were referring to Freddie Gray, who was killed in Baltimore in the back of the police van. And it was like a Freddie Gray goose. And it was just, it was his face on like a, he, what happened was they broke his back in the back of this police car. And they had like, it was the, it was his face on the body of a goose and it Mm -hmm. had like a broken neck. And I'm just like, what is going on? And from that, just, so I, I think that was Britain's first Spanish Town Parade because I think he had just gotten to Baton Rouge not too long ago. And we went, and I was like, I haven't been to one since. Right. And when I went home, I just, I needed to to get out 
everything that I had internalized Mm -hmm. being a part of that parade. And it all just kind (laughs) of just came out on paper. And then it was out there and the the advocate was calling. And I I was just, I never, it was beautiful. It it never dawned on me that it was going to be that big of a deal. I was just, (laughs) <laughs> you were moved. Yeah, I was just I was just trying to to feel better. Right. And I didn't feel better but to to not have all those feelings inside. I right. wanted to to get them out just to to release. Right. And so I wasn't expecting all the the attention that it got. It mm-hmm. surprised me. <laughs> well, surprised because it, it got ended up getting piece. picked up in Los Angeles. It surprised the heck out of me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, as we wrap this up, tell me what's in the future for Shelley Moore White. Um, beyond law, beyond Miller and Daughter, uh, beyond being Mrs. Britton White, what's in the future for Shelley Moore White? Well, my mother would like me to tell you that I'm trying to get pregnant, although I'm not right now. <laughs> she she got in front of the church and praying for triplets. <laughs> and she's telling anybody who listens that she's praying for triplets. So that's what I mean. And it's on the horizon, but not as soon as my sister or my mother would like. But that that's coming. Um but more of the same, uh, I'm still going to be here talking a lot, being loud, <laughs> saying whatever I feel like saying and mm-hmm. consequences, whatever. I, I'm, I'm still going to be me. Um, I, my family talks a lot. And so saying what I want to say has never been a problem. Uh, and people can take it how they how they want. You were not at the table and they were telling you, Shelly, hush. You, yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you, my mama has a big mouth and she gave it to me. Okay. And <laughs> And she knows, she tells me, like, you just like me, but you're worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if I agree with her because I wasn't here in her heyday. So I don't right. know if I'm worse than her, but right. I, I definitely see where I, I get a lot of me from between my mama and my grandfather. So there's right. a whole lot of talking. <laughs> uh, and But it's going to be more the same. I'm still, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I can to, to move Baton Rouge forward, to move Louisiana forward. I don't want my hometown and my home state to be the butt of jokes. I don't want us to be a place where everyone feels they need to leave. Mm -hmm. I don't want any of that. And I also don't want it to be a place that I wouldn't feel comfortable raising my mama's triplets. Mm -hmm. I want it to be a place. I intend to be here, but I want it to be a place that I feel comfortable and safe and happy to be here and raise my children. So I intend to do whatever I can, whatever I need to do to to move that that agenda forward. Um, I hopefully will start writing a little more, reading a little more, because <laughs> mm. I feel like that is the writing. The writing is my my shelter, and the reading helps inform my writing. So all that needs to happen in in, in one place. Um, the podcast will go on. Do you see public service as something that you would like? Everybody yeah. wants me to see it. <laughs> mm. I don't. I don't know. Uh, And part of my my hesitation is I know that I am very particularly concerned with advancing the black community Mm -hmm. and part of public service is being particularly concerned with advancing everybody. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you can advance everybody while advancing the black community, but being in South Louisiana, they're not going to like a lot of what I have to say. Sure. And, um, the, the act of actually getting elected to the public service (laughs) is, is a a concern. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Uh, part of me wants to run for something. I'm not even sure what it would be. Mm -hmm. Part of me wants to run for something. And part of me wants to be on the outside talking a lot of noise and exciting change from the people that are elected. Mm -hmm. So I haven't decided which way I'm going to, I'm going to fall just yet. But people are constantly, what are you going to run for? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe nothing. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't decided and keep talking about it, praying about it. We'll figure it out. Well, I'm very happy that you chose to spend part of your day with us. Yes, I love being here. And uh, we're grateful. And uh, whatever it is that you choose to do, I'm sure it's going to turn out to be a tremendous success. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for viewing. Thank you for listening. We'll be back again next time.